Hello everyone, this is not a park egg here. In my previous video, Jurassic Park 3 got a missed opportunity in my opinion. I concluded that Jurassic Park 3 could and should have been a way better movie. Joe Johnston, in an interview with Fred Stoppel, stated that the team never really had a finished script on set. They had thrown away the Buchmann script. They left in some scenes, yes, but consequences were severe. There were loose ends and lots of guesses. Like, how did Cooper get injured? And not by that big spinosaurus, of course. Did he fall and broke his arm? Filming the cause of his misfortune prior to his death would have made the movie much Cooper. cooler. I heard that people toyed with the idea to let him stumble upon a uh, Spinosaurus nest and gets attacked by a juvenile Spino. Cooper kills that one and Mama gets very angry. But I can understand that it would have been pretty similar to The Lost World. Another thing is Billy's survival. How in the Jurassic world is that even possible? He got packed to death in that stream by, by, by the Pteranodons. Come on, no one could escape such a rage alive. But because there was no real beginning, middle, end and end, anything was possible. And I really pity the editor of the movie. My biggest problem with JP3 is that they got a good script with an interesting storyline and interesting characters. The Buchmann script. Release the Buchmann script. Filming Buchmann script would have been the best choice. Just a few adjustments and I believe it would have been on the same level as The Lost World. It could also would have set the stage, a possible stage, for the return of Lewis Dotson and his bias in company and for perhaps even Dr. Wu in a Jurassic Park 4. Who knows, somewhere in another universe. No, just kidding. We will never really know. It's all in the past now. But we can dream, and that is exactly what I'm going to do. I promised you in my previous video to give you a tagline and a synopsis of how Jurassic Park 3 should have been. On a side note, before I start, I think composer Don Davies did a good job on the soundtrack. It's good in my opinion, taking up several Jurassic Park themes and there are also some threads from the Lost World music woven into the JP3 soundtrack, if you listen very closely. I only wasn't that fond of, let's say, the Kirby's reunion theme. Well, let's get into it. Jurassic Park Breakout. Here comes the tagline that I have in mind. An American couple disappears during a parasailing trip in Costa Rica. Harlan Finch reaches out to paleontologist Dr. Alan Grant to help the US government to gain sovereignty over Isla Sauna, Site B. The cast members are, well, actually I will mention their, their character names, Harlan Finch, Simone Garcia, Alan Grant, Billy Hume, Paul Roby, Miles Roby, Susan Brentworth, Cooper as a bodyguard instead of a mercenary, Tom Udesky, a pilot, and yeah, there is no Nash in this story. Carlos Lopez, Minister of um, Interior of Costa Rica. Jeannie and Rick. And then, of course, what dinosaurs do we see in this movie that I would have liked to see in theatres? Let's kick out Horner's wish. Spinosaurus and replace her, or him, I don't know, with Baryonyx. As was first thought of the velociraptors just the awesome jp3 raptors stan winston made the parasaurolophus corythosaurus pteranodons which are not dinosaurs of course they are flying reptiles ankylosaurus comsognathus triceratops stegosaurus brachiosaurus please with a way better cgi or just practical effects and let's kick out ceratosaurus and keep the original carnotaurus just don't mind about Disney's dinosaurs movie. 
And last, but of course not least, a juvenile T-Rex. Here comes the uh, treatment or synopsis. An American couple disappears during a parasailing trip in Costa Rica. The American government gets alarmed, sends Harlan Finch to investigate. He has talks with the Costa Rican Minister of Interior, Carlos Lopez. Simone Garcia, a biologist, shows a lacerated body at a local police station. She suspects there has been an Isla Sauna breakout. Harlan Finch attends a lecture in Utah at a paleontological dig. He wants the help from Dr. Alan Grant. Grant wants to raise money for a research center on Site B, and he is assisted by a graduate student, Billy Hume, a bit of a nerdish guy. They show a 3D printed resonating chamber of a velociraptor. Finch promises Alan Grant exclusive research rights to the dinosaur island if he helps him to gain US sovereignty over Isla Sauna, Site B, during a special hearing about possible dinosaur attacks on the mainland. But he needs to fly to San Jose, capital of Costa Rica. And that is where wealthy businessman Paul Roby and his 12-year-old son step in. Paul Roby likes to take Alan Grant on his private jet, together with his son, business associate Susan Brentworth, and his bodyguard Cooper. He also promises Grant a substantial contribution to his research. Billy urges Grant to do so for new equipment. Deal is sealed. And in the meantime, Simone Garcia reports about new attacks on the mainland to Minister Lopez. Tom Udesky flies Roby's jet over Isla Sorna, but suddenly something mysterious hits them. They crash land in the trees. The nose breaks off and Udesky is snatched out by a fierce and wounded baryonyx. Miles gets saved by Cooper, when the fuselage of the plane almost crashes on him. The survivors get away, but encounter a young T-Rex. The T-Rex chases after Grant's group, but they run into the baryonyx, and there is a big fight between those two carnivorous creatures. The baryonyx blinds the T-Rex with its long claws. Grant barely escapes, so yes, the T-Rex loses, but he survives the attack. On the Costa Rican mainland, the hearing is on its way, but Finch and Garcia are still waiting for Alan Grant. The reports of the attacks throughout the country are discussed. During the hearing, Finch expresses his fears for a Jurassic world. If these creatures have been breeding populations all over the country. Soon it won't just be a Costa Rican problem anymore. Finch is worried about Grant's whereabouts and gets in touch with his intelligence contacts in the States. On the island, Grant's group finds the remains of Rick, the missing American tourist, wrapped and eaten in his parasail. He probably died during the crash and was eaten by smaller dinosaurs. Roby and Brentworth discover dinosaur nests along a stream bed. Grant immediately recalls the eggshells from Jurassic Park. These must be raptor eggs. This, this could have been the only flashback scene from the first movie instead of this talking supposedly JP-1 raptor and Grant streaming during the flight. They quickly move on and find refuge in a workers' village where they find the Site B lab. Grant hopes to be able to contact the mainland. He can't and the group finds out that velociraptors are after them. When running to a certain building, Miles gets behind and Cooper selflessly defends him trying to chase the velociraptors away with a stick. Miles survives. Cooper gets killed in the effort. The survivors escape the compound on dirt bikes and later hide in the treetops. Okay, hold it right there. In Jurassic Park 3, when Grant, Billy and the three Kirbys escape from a Spinosaurus and take refuge in a building, they suddenly end up in the Pteranodon aviary. How? From the outside, 
There's absolutely no sign of the big glassy aviary dome. It's big, and yet it can't be seen on screen. Of course, it could be suggested that it's down there in the gorge behind the building, but still, it was not supposed to be there yet. Hence, this concept art. Now we know how. Because originally, this building still belonged to the workers' village. It's not close to that strong-looking, yet weak fence. And the group escapes from this building into the forest, and they enter the aviary later on. Well, let's continue with the film treatment. The raptors do not give up their hunt. Grant does not understand their behavior until he discovers that Billy has stolen two raptor eggs. They start an argument about it and fall from the tree. Immediately, the raptors surround them. Grant returns the eggs to the leading female raptor and discovers that Billy has taken the velociraptor resonating chamber with him. He starts to recreate raptor calls with it, distracting the egg hunters. And I leave. In Costa Rica, the hearing is over and Finch is waiting for the outcome. During that time, Finch and Simone Garcia visit a village where, in the villagers' words, a dragon has supposedly been captured, only to find a broken cage and dead villagers. Simultaneously, on the island, Grant, Bully, Miles, Paul and Susan enter unwittingly a giant bird cage. The Costa Rican police encounter frightened fishermen who have netted an unknown creature. They finally have a corpse, and Simone identifies it as a Pteranodon. They have escaped side B. At that moment, when crossing a bridge, Miles is snatched by a giant Pteranodon, which drops him in its nests with hungry babies. Billy takes Rick's parasail, which he had recovered from his dead body. They took it with them during the flight across the jungle. He jumps into the canyon to save Miles from the nest, but four Pteranodons attack them while airborne. Miles survives the fall in the water beneath him, but Billy is taken by the biggest of the flying reptiles. He is dragged away in the stream and packed to death by the others. In Costa Rica, Finch gets the news from the intelligence service that recent satellite images show Roby's crashed plane on side B. Finch urges Minister Lopez to cooperate. He fears that Alan Grant must be dead. A strike is ordered on Isla Sorna. The dinosaurs must die. They have been proven to be a real threat to the mainland. Other countries must be spared the danger and the risk. Simone does not agree on bombing the island. There must be other ways to keep Site B quarantined and contained. She also mentions that they are not sure if the Robies and Grant are dead. Ellen Grant and the Roby family find a barge and head to the Ingen Marina. On their way, they encounter a group of crossing ankylosaurs. By nightfall, Paul Roby needs to go to... Do his thing, you know. If you gotta go, you gotta go. And he finds himself close to another toilet of dino droppings. Droppings. He feels an ominous presence. He quickly covers himself with dino dung and sneaks back onto the boat. When the dinosaur reveals himself on the banks of the river, Grant identifies it with a Carnotaurus. It seems to camouflage. At the marina, they are attacked by the baryonics. The creature destroys the wheelhouse. The group gets trapped in the protective boat cage that falls into the water. Roby escapes and tries to distract the baryonics. Grant finds a flare gun and fires it at the dinosaur, igniting a slick of gasoline on the water that has been spilled during the attack. The baryonics being heavily burnt retreats into the forest alongside the river. At dawn, A-10 warthogs and helicopters appear in the sky. Finch is in one of the helicopters, together with Simone Garcia, who has convinced him to search for survivors first. They enclose a beach close to the engine marina. Alan Grant and the others have found a crashed boat. Alan discovers 
that this must be the boat from the Parasail Company. They must have come too close to the island. Then Miles discovers something moving in the treetops. Pteranodons, they set out to attack one of the helicopters. Finch's helicopter saves the survivors, but during this rescue mission, Grant is almost snatched by the biggest Pteranodon. Finch orders to drop the bombs. Grant and Garcia are furious, but Finch tells them it's U.S. territory now. On the Navy aircraft carrier, Finch explains to Grant and Garcia that not only Costa Rica has dinosaur troubles now. And during this scene, we see a biologist, Martin Gutierrez, finding the remains of a small dinosaur that has been dropped by monkeys and we see pteranodons evade the human bombing attack. Finch ends with, There's already a breakout, Dr. Grant. We have to do something to protect the world from becoming Jurassic. Grant hates to say it, but he says it anyway. In the end, life will find a way. And after these words, a group of Baryonyxes finds refuge in the river, and the Velociraptors escape into their underground tunnels on the island. Well, uh, there it is, how Jurassic Park 3 should have been Buchmann's Jurassic Park breakout. By the way, I left out that annoying yellow satellite phone. It definitely was annoying in the theatre. Back then, mobile phones were not yet that common, so everyone was like, switch off that stupid thing, whoever you are, we are watching a movie. I also left out Ellie Settler for obvious reasons. In Buchmann's script, there was no room or role for her. She could be saved for another entry in a future Jurassic Park or Jurassic World movie. Sorry, Charlie, I liked you. I really did. Oh, and no miraculous return of Billy. So the Alan Grant hat does not return. Man, he could not have survived an attack by several pteranodons. Come on, he just can't. In Buchmann's script, Billy Hume died a hero. And that's enough. Probably many of you don't agree on kicking out Spinosaurus for Baryonyx and Ceratosaurus for Carnotaurus. I just, you know, put away that sentiment. Of course, they can be left in and, and still keep the Buchmann script intact. But this is how I think it would have been best and could have set the stage for a whole different and I believe better Jurassic World trilogy. Anyway... This is what we got, Jurassic Park 3. I do like the logo though. Let me know in the comments what you think. And if you liked this video, like it and subscribe to my channel, Not A Park Egg. I would really appreciate it. The next video will be a new Jurassic Talk with Michael Brown about the upcoming Jurassic World 4 or Jurassic Park 7. And afterwards, Later, perhaps more Mattel Hammond collection, dinosaurs and characters. This was Not A Park Egg. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.